Hi all my wonderful TM joiners. I'm Priya Mystery, the TMJ doc. And in this video, I'll be talking about tongue tie and ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. So how is a tongue tie related to a diagnosis of ADHD? Watch this video until the end to find out. This discussion is a bit of a journey where you can't really see the destination until we get there. So bear with me. <laughs> There's a lot to explain as I move through this, but I'll be my best in being clear and concise. Additionally, I have a new segment called Highlighting a TM Joiner, where I take one of your comments and highlight it in each of my videos, and then I sort of respond to it. So feel free to comment below if you want your comment to eventually be chosen for a video. Before getting into it, be sure to check out my social media accounts. This includes Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all the things, and be sure to follow and subscribe. I post a lot of information on all of those, but especially on Instagram and TikTok. We have updated my office website as well, so check that out. Also, I have facial rollers now that can help really ease up the tight knots and tight bands of tissue in the masseter muscles and in the temporalis muscles. I've linked these above and below and stay tuned, keep an eye out as I'm excited to be developing more products for our TMJ community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a general dentist with a practice in beautiful Vancouver, Washington. At my practice, we are dedicated to taking care of those with TMJ disorders. So let's get right into it. Let's start by defining a tongue tie. What is a tongue tie? Well, underneath our tongues is a band of tissue called the frenum or the frenulum. All of us have this band of tissue, but that does not mean that all of us automatically have a tongue tie. When this band of tissue, the frenum or frenulum, restricts tongue mobility and therefore affects function, that is when you have a tongue tie. Many believe that you have to have an obvious speech impediment to have a tongue tie, and that's just not the case. Tongue ties can be a lot less obvious and a lot more common than you think. Additionally, there is a gene linked to tongue ties. This gene is autosomal dominant. It's a dominant, not a recessive gene, which means it can easily be passed from generation to generation. Tongue ties are classified into four categories. Classes one and two are the ones that are easy to see and easy to identify. That is because the tie can be visualized very close to, if not at the tip of the tongue. Classes one and two have the frenum at the tip of the tongue or two to four millimeters behind the tip of the tongue. Classes three and four for tongue ties are a little bit more tricky. They're harder to see and therefore can be a little more difficult to diagnose. Diagnosing these tongue ties requires not only seeing, but feeling the restriction. Checking the jaw range of motion, checking the tongue range of motion. There's certain measurements that can be taken to diagnose these tongue ties. Classes one and two are anterior or forward tongue ties. Classes three and four are posterior or backward tongue ties, further back. If you're someone who knows a bit about tongue ties, you may know that there's a raging debate about whether posterior tongue ties even exist. Some people think it does, some people think it does not. I'm not even going to entertain that. I know them to exist from my practical experience as well as my personal experience. So we're just going to move on right past that. All tongue ties have the potential to negatively affect nursing, chewing, speaking, swallowing, breathing, and correct tongue posture. In this video, we'll be focusing on breathing and correct tongue posture, and how if a tongue tie affects those two things, it can then lead to a potential misdiagnosis of ADHD. Let's start by defining correct tongue posture. What is that anyway? Correct tongue posture is when the entire tongue, the tip, the middle, and the back is up against the roof of the mouth with a light suction. Do you have correct tongue posture? Check right now. If you're watching this video, your lips should be sealed. So if you're talking, stop talking. <laughs> if you're watching this video, your lips should be sealed and your tongue should be up against the roof of your mouth with the light suction. Is yours there? Is it sort of floating around in the middle of your mouth? Is it down low on the floor of your mouth? Check where your tongue is when you're at rest, when you're not 
chewing when you're not speaking, comment below. I'd love to know where you find your tongue. When the tongue is in the correct position all the time, the upper arch up here, the roof of the mouth or the palate, it will grow and develop wide, flat, and forward. That is ideal development for the upper arch. With this type of development, there is usually no teeth crowding or crowded teeth because the upper arch or the palate develops in such a way that it can accommodate all the teeth. So to clarify, when the tongue is in the correct position with a light suction up against the roof of the mouth like this, it's exerting pressure over time onto the roof of the mouth to help it develop into that wide, flat, and forward growth pattern. When the upper arch develops wide, flat, and forward, the lower arch kind of naturally follows. When both of these arches then grow wide, flat, and forward, the nasopharyngeal airway, which is an air space, kind of like a tunnel behind our noses and our mouths, also grows wide forward to its full genetic potential, having a nice wide airway for when we're breathing standing up or lying down. Now let's consider when the tongue is not in the correct position. So instead of being up against the roof of the mouth with a light suction, the tongue is just always sitting down low in the mouth on the floor of the mouth. When the tongue is sitting low on the floor of the mouth, there is no pressure being exerted onto the roof of the mouth. So there's nothing to guide its growth wide, flat, and forward. So instead, the palate, the roof of the mouth, becomes narrow and arched. And when it becomes narrow and arched like that, it cannot accommodate all the permanent teeth. So the teeth come in crowded. There's not enough room for them on that upper arch. In this scenario, because the upper arch did not grow wide, flat, and forward, neither did the lower arch. The lower arch typically follows what the upper arch does. Because of this type of development, the nasopharyngeal airway, that airway behind our nose and our mouths, also does not grow to its full genetic potential. Instead, the space that it has is impinged upon by these bones and this bone not being forward enough. Everything is kind of stuck back and that airway is then made smaller. A smaller nasopharyngeal airway means a higher risk for having obstructive sleep apnea. What's obstructive sleep apnea or OSA? According to the National Health Institute, obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, is characterized by episodes of complete apnea or partial hypopnea, collapse of the upper airway with an associated decrease in oxygen saturation or arousal from sleep. This disturbance results in fragmented, non-restorative sleep. Basically, with obstructive sleep apnea, the upper airway is blocked or obstructed. This leads to not getting enough oxygen at night, and that leads to fragmented, non-restorative sleep. If we're not breathing well, we're not sleeping well. What are things that can actually cause the obstructions? What can block the airway? We've already listed off a few and I'll come back around to those. But in addition to those, enlarged adenoids or enlarged tonsils caused by allergies can block the airway. Muscles that lose their tone over time can block the airway. This is common in menopausal women or just as any of us age. The airway itself just being very small can also be an obstruction. It just didn't develop to its full wide genetic potential. The airway can also be obstructed by incorrect tongue posture. When the airway is obstructed, breathing can stop or slow down, which leads to inadequate oxygen saturation. Not having enough oxygen in our body while we're sleeping puts our bodies into fight or flight mode. This is a very stressful mode for our bodies to be in. This can often lead to mini arousals while we're sleeping during which we awaken <gasps> gasping just to get some oxygen and then we go right back asleep. For those mini arousals, we don't necessarily remember them in the morning. So many people have these but have no awareness of having these unless they have a bed partner or someone that's witnessed these. With sleep apnea, the body is basically struggling all night long to get adequate oxygenation. If the body is struggling all night long, it's in fight or flight mode, there are mini arousals, you can imagine that the deepest levels of sleep 
are likely not reached. Deep sleep is important for the release of growth hormones, for immune function, for healing. Deep sleep is incredibly restorative and we all need it. And children actually need more of it. Adults need about one hour, children need about two hours or more depending on their age. So essentially, obstructive sleep apnea leads to fragmented and basically unrestorative and horrible sleep. Adults who have had night after night of fragmented and unrestorative sleep appear exhausted and exhibit excessive daytime sleepiness. They are exhausted and they act exhausted. It's kind of a no-brainer and easy to figure out. Here's where it gets tricky. Children with fragmented sleep and obstructive sleep apnea, however, exhibit hyperactivity and behavioral issues. So instead of acting exhausted, children do the opposite and act hyperactive. If you're interested for more on that, I've linked the Mayo Clinic's information about pediatric sleep apnea in the description box below. So be sure to check that out. When children are constantly acting hyper and have disruptive behavior, it can easily lead to a diagnosis of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. According to the American Sleep Apnea Association, studies show that as many as 25% of children diagnosed with ADHD actually may have symptoms of OSA and that much of their learning difficulty and behavior problems may be due to chronic fragmented sleep. Imagine that up to 25% of children diagnosed with ADHD may not actually have ADHD and they may have obstructive sleep apnea instead. That's a large percentage. Additionally, it's been found that removing tonsils and adenoids in children, tonsils and adenoids are the lymphatic tissue that can grow too large. Removing them in children can lead to an improvement in behavior, an improved quality of sleep, as well as learning ability. To clarify, adenoids and tonsils are lymphatic tissue that should shrink by a certain age. If children suffer from allergies, these tissues can become enlarged and stay enlarged and obstruct the airway, which can then cause pediatric obstructive sleep apnea. Additionally, having a tongue tie can lead to a tongue posture that is low and posterior back into the airway. Having the tongue back into the airway makes the airway smaller, which can also be a cause for pediatric obstructive sleep apnea. Take a look at these images. She did not have enlarged adenoids. She did not have enlarged tonsils. She did have a tongue tie and she had incorrect low and posterior back tongue posture. This patient had a tongue tie and underwent the treatment necessary to release the tongue tie. She did the physical therapy leading up to the tongue tie release, as well as the physical therapy after the tongue tie release to train the tongue to stay in the correct tongue position after the frenum was released. This physical therapy is called myofunctional therapy. For more information on that, check out my video, what is myofunctional therapy, which I've linked above. You can see here that the improved tongue posture having the tongue up against the roof of the mouth and forward really impacted the airway in a very positive way. The airway is now bigger. This patient had a diagnosis of mild obstructive sleep apnea before the tongue tie release and no apneic episodes after. And to clarify, I'm not saying that everybody with sleep apnea needs to have a tongue tie release. This is a very specific case where it helped this patient the causes of sleep apnea are vast and varied, and so not everyone will benefit from a tongue tie release. This is just one example. I also want to clarify that tongue tie cannot directly cause ADHD. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that a tongue tie can increase the risk of having pediatric obstructive sleep apnea, which leads to behavioral issues, which can then be misdiagnosed as ADHD, when the real issue is chronic exhaustion and sleep apnea. Take a look at these flow charts. A tongue tie can lead to low and posterior or back tongue posture, which can lead to a smaller airway, which can lead to pediatric obstructive sleep apnea, which can lead to behavioral issues, which can then lead to an incorrect diagnosis of ADHD. Let's look at the next one. 
a tongue tie can lead to underdeveloped jaw bones, which can then lead to a smaller airway, which can lead to pediatric obstructive sleep apnea, which can lead to behavioral issues, which can lead to an incorrect diagnosis of ADHD. So that really sums it up. <laughs> I hope you found this video informative. Now let's move on to my new segment called Highlighting a TM Joiner. In this video, I'll be highlighting a comment from at tan17391. Can you have first signs of TMJD months before being diagnosed? I had dizziness followed by shoulder pain, stiff neck, sound sensitivity before developing jaw numbness and finally got a diagnosis of TMJD. The answer is yes. Sometimes TMD can start slowly and sort of creep up on us, and it can have these symptoms that seem sort of out there or unrelated to the jaw. There are some people who have sharp shooting ear pain that'll come and go, and that's their only symptom. So obviously they go to the ear, nose, and throat doctor first to get their ear checked when it's actually originating from the jaw or jaw dysfunction. Other people have dizziness, only dizziness, and that can also be related. So yes, TMD can creep up. It can be these symptoms that seem unrelated. And for that reason, it's often called the great imposter disease. So I hope that answers your question. So that's really it, my friends. Again, I'm Dr. Priya Mystery, and I hope you found this video informative. If so, please feel free to like, subscribe, and share with your family and friends. If you're looking for pain relief from the comfort of your own home, please feel free to download my free PDF guide called Three Steps to TMJD Pain Relief. You can find this on my office website if you go to the home page and scroll all the way down. Please feel free to leave a question or a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. And remember, my friends, you can never have TMI about TMJ. Thank you.